So we're talking about differential equations. Now the word differential, if you see that word floating around, you should really think of it as being a derivative. So a differential equation is an equation which involves a derivative. And they're important, in fact, they show up a lot in various applications. Physics has them, uh, economics has them. Anytime you need to model some sort of system where things are changing, it turns out that differential equations come into play. Because what's happening? Well, what you have is an equation that involves both the function and the derivative of the function. So there's an example that's mentioned here, which is called, uh, well, this is called Hooke's Law. Well, it's not quite Hooke's Law, but it's related to Hooke's Law. And uh, what do you have? Well, you have a spring, and it says, what happens? Well, if you've ever played with a spring, you, you know the following. So imagine you have a spring, and it has one end fixed, and you, you have this, and here's a little weight on the end. If you pull the string, pull the spring, excuse me, what happens? It wants to go up. Yes? Now the reason it wants to go up is there's something pulling it up. It's acceleration. And the further you pull it down, the stronger the pull back up. Similarly, if you try to push it all the way up, compress the string, spring, it tries to push back. And the further you push it up, the stronger it pushes back. So it's saying that the acceleration, it depends on how far you've pulled it away from where it's at equilibrium. So the further you pull it away, the stronger that acceleration. The reason you have a minus sign is it's saying, if you pull in one direction, the acceleration is trying to pull you back the other way. So that's where that equation is coming from. And once you understand what things represent, it's like, okay, I can understand. It's like the acceleration. I'm being pulled opposite to where I'm at until I'm being pulled towards my center. Now, you can solve this once you have a few more tools, and you get those tools when you take your differential equations course. This particular one, it's not a very hard one, but it's a little bit outside the scope of what we want. So our goal is to say, let's take an equation that's probably a little bit simpler than this, that relates the, the derivative and the function itself, and try to recover what is the function? What does it look like? Now, it turns out, I'll just go ahead and mention, you know, what type of functions have this behavior? You can check. One example of this is any multiple, I'll call it capital A, of sine of square root of k times t. So the question is, all right, I'll actually give you the full solution, just for fun. Plus b times cosine square root of k times t. So anything which satisfies x double prime of t equals negative kx of t must look like that. Now in some sense, it's easy to check. Like if I have this expression, you take two derivatives, well, every time you take a derivative of sine, what's going to happen? Well, first you go from sine, then you'll get cosine, then you get back to negative sine. So it's the negative of what you want after two derivatives. But you have to pull out a square root of k every time because of the chain rule. So put them together, you'll get negative k times what you started with. Similarly for the other expression. So checking a solution is easy. Finding a solution is tough, very tough. So tough that a lot of them you can't do. And, uh, and even the ones that you can do, they're not easy, which is why there's classes, multiple classes, about how you solve these types of problems. But the good news is there are some things that we can do. In some sense, we've already solved a special case. And the really special case, and in some sense, the really uninteresting case, is suppose I have the derivative is some function f of x, and I have information about what the value of the function is at a particular point. So that can be solved. And we solved that when we talked about antiderivatives. We said, okay, uh, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for some function whose derivative is f of x. So suppose I have this. I have the derivative of some function is 1 over x squared plus 1. Well, okay, let's start by taking the antiderivative. What's the antiderivative of 1 over x squared plus 1? Arctangent. Of course, we've got to throw an arctangent in. It's good times, good times. But remember what's true about antiderivatives. 
plus c. So if we're told that y prime equals 1 over 1 plus x squared, that says, OK, we know then, because we're looking for the antiderivative, that y has to have the form arctangent of x plus c. Now the question is, which c? Now if I stopped it right there and said, given that y prime equals 1 over x squared plus 1, find y of x, that's the right answer. But there was this other piece that says, oh, I'll give you some additional information. See, it's not just any antiderivative. It's a particular antiderivative which satisfies a certain property. Namely, y of 1 equals 2. The way to read this is that if you plug in x equals 1, because that's our input, you get y equals 2. So we're going to come over to here, and we plug in that information. So 2 equals arctangent of 1 plus c. So now I can use that additional piece of information to help me solve for my constant. By the way, what is arctangent of 1? 5 over 4. So we get that c is equal to 2 minus pi over 4, because I can pull that across. So we go back and say, all right, so our, our function is y equals arctangent of x plus 2 minus pi over 4. So that is the function which satisfies both the differential equation and the initial value. In some sense, every time you take an antiderivative, you have that 1 plus c coming in. And that means you have to figure a way to figure out what's the right choice for c. How do you pick c? So you need a piece of information. Every antiderivative, you need one piece of information. Now, for us, we're only going to work with having to do one derivative. So that's good news for us. All right. So let's uh, continue on. And in general, that case we just did, that's a really special case, it's actually pretty straightforward to solve. So, which is to say, if I have y prime of x is equal to f of x, so when I'm talking about the special case, I'm referring specifically to this one, y prime equals f of x and y of a equals b, then it has to be the case that y of x equals b plus the integral from a to x of f of t dt. And that's the solution. It's guaranteed to work. Well, let's check. So to check something as a solution, we have to do what? Well, we have to verify that the derivative is what we claim and that the value of the function is what we claim. Because those are the two things that need to be satisfied. Let's start with the value of the function. y of a, so that would be equal to b plus the integral from a to a of f of t dt. But what's the integral from a to a of f of t dt? It's zero. So we end up with b. That wasn't so bad. So y prime of x, well, that's what happens when you take the derivative of the function. So b plus integral a to x of f of t dt. The derivative of b, zero. And if I take the derivative of the integral from a to x of f of t dt, what will I get? f of x. Why will I get f of x? What allows me to say that? The fundamental theorem. So the fundamental theorem says, hey, this notion of integration and derivatives are tied together. All right. So that tells us we can handle things as long as it's of the form y prime equals some function of x. So those are not the interesting ones. So we're going to try to do something a little bit more interesting, which is let's start throwing in pieces of y. So in particular, we're going to have things that look like y prime is equal to stuff with x and y. All right. Well, at this point, this is when we start saying not everything can be done. But we're going to handle something which can be a very special case. And these are going to be called the separable differential equations. So, all right. Uh, we're going to go through the process of, of how to solve it. But you might say, how do you recognize if something is a separable differential equation? The good news is, if you're taking, say, I don't know, an exam, and you see 
something. The way to recognize if, if you have a separable differential equation is you do the following. You say, do I have something that looks like y prime equals stuff with x and y? And if the answer is yes, that's separable differential equations. And if the answer is no, that's not. So easy check. All right, we're going to do a, several examples. All right, so here's the process. So when we call something a separable differential equation, what it really says is that I can really pull apart the part with x and the part with, with y. So it's not just that y prime equals stuff with x and y. It says, look, I can write prime as a function of x times a function of y for some functions f and g. This first process in the separable differential equations is you do what I like to call separate, and hence its name. And you want to put all the terms with y on one side and all the terms with x on the other. So that's not so bad. Now, there's two ways to think about it. Now, if you think about y prime as just y prime, this is what you would do. But another way to think about y prime is you can think about it as dy dx. Now, technically speaking, dy dx is not two things. It's not a dy and then separately from that a dx. It's just a single part. However, for the purposes of exploration, it can be helpful in certain circumstances to do think about them as separate. And this is one of those times. And so what we can think of it is like, OK, I have the dy. That's a y. So I'm going to put the g of y over there by dividing. And this dx, I'll multiply so I get f of x dx. So step one is to separate. So this is how I remember. Now, what do you do after you separate it? Well, now you have two sides, and you integrate. So we take the integral of both sides. And what do we do? Well, we need to add a plus c. So this is the what, stage I like to call integrate. So first, you separate, and then you integrate. Now at this point, you might say, hold on. Wait a second. You forgot something. You only have a plus c on one side. What about the plus c on the other side? Ha, ha, ha. Well, that's a good question. Do we need a, a plus c on both sides? And the answer is no. The reason the answer is no is if I have a plus c on the right-hand side and I have a plus c on the other left-hand side, that means I have two constants. I can move one of the constants across and combine them together. So the way I like to think of it is that constants are like sponges. And they like to absorb other constants. So if you have two constants multiplying together, and uh, one of them is an arbitrary constant, the arbitrary constant just absorbs that other number. If you have e to an arbitrary constant, then it's just another arbitrary constant. It just gets absorbed. We'll see examples of this. So you don't need to have two plus these, just one. One is enough. And the last step, so not too many steps in the process, that's good for us. The last step is to solve for c. Because remember, we're going to get a c out. We need to figure out which constant to use and then solve for y. Now, some people prefer to do it in the other order. Solve for y first, and then solve for c. Regardless of which order you choose, you'll end up at the same place. I like to solve for c as early as I can, because I find it's often easier to just have a number to play with than it is to keep track of the plus c. So to, so to finish our, our sort of three-step process, separate, integrate, well, I didn't have a good word for this, so we'll make up a bad word. Uncomplicate, which is another way of saying simplify. So, so that's it. If you can remember those three steps, separate it, integrate it, uncomplicate it. Then you can solve any separable differential equation. So let's do lots of examples. Any questions before we jump into our examples? All right. And away we go. Well, it turns out that rabbits like to make more rabbits. It's their favorite pastime. And in particular, suppose that there are initially 20 rabbits and that the rate of change of the population is one-tenth of the current population. 
Determine the population as a function of time. So let's think of this. So we're going to have a function of time. So we're going to call that P of t. This is our, our population at time t. So that's what we're after. We're trying to figure out what this function is. So we're going to try to decipher what this statement is telling us. It says that there are initially 20 rabbits. So initial is oftentimes a way to give us what we would call initial conditions. And we take that to mean at time zero, when you start. So our population at time zero is equal to 20. Now, what do we have? Well, the rate of change. When you see the word the rate of change, what do you think? Think derivative. So the rate of change of the population, which is the derivative of the population, is, what, how do we translate is? Equals one-tenth, which means one-tenth, of the current population. And the current population is P of t. Now, if we suppress the of t, which is oftentimes done when writing differential equations, this could be written as p prime is equal to one-tenth times p. So that's the differential e equation. So the rate of change is proportional to how many rabbits there are. In other words, if you have a small number of rabbits, there's not much change happening. But if you have a large number of rabbits, there's a lot more rabbits coming in. All right. So now we have our setup. We have our equation, and we have our initial condition. So we solve. So I like to think of this as p prime. I'm going to think of it as d p d t. T because I'm thinking of things as changing with time. So that's equal to p. Uh, sorry, one tenth p. So step one to separate. Well, I'm going to move the p across. So you get dp divided by p is equal to, over here, I got to move the dt across, one tenth dt. So now we've done step one. All right, that wasn't so bad. Step two. Integrate. So we integrate. The integral of dp over p, what would that be? So it's like 1 over p. Or if you think of, if you don't like 1 over p, think of it as 1 over x. How do you integrate 1 over x? Natural log. So now instead of x, it's, it's p, but it's the same process. So it would be natural log of p is equal to integral of 1 tenth dt. One-tenth t. Yeah, some people would say, oh, the integral of one-tenth dt would be one-tenth x, because, no, no, no. What's the variable we're using? We're using t, so it's one-tenth t. And, of course, plus c. Now, I'm going to hold off on solving for the c for just a second. So suppose we first want to solve for p. The good news is there's only a single p. That makes our life easier. How do I get the p outside of the log? I can use the exponential function. I use e. So we've done our integrate. Now comes our uncomplicate. So we free the p. So we have that p, which is e to the natural log of p. That's the same as e to the 1 tenth t plus c. Now you can rewrite that, because you have that addition up in the exponent. That's e to the 1 tenth t times e to the c, because addition up in the exponent becomes multiplication. Now remember what I said about constants. They like to sort of absorb constants. If I have e to an arbitrary constant, what do I have? A number. Some number. I just don't know. So what we can do is we can say, well, let's recall this number, change it to something else. I'll change it and call it some constant d. So we can now conclude that p is equal to some constant d e to the one tenth t. Now, are we done? Not yet. What haven't we, we done? Well, we haven't solved for our constant, right? Because we need to use our initial conditions. The initial conditions help you solve for the constants. If you try to solve for the initial, sorry, if you try to solve for the constants without using the initial conditions, you're doing it wrong. We don't want to do it wrong. We've only got one more chance to show how great we are. We're going to do it right. So 
we plug in time equals zero and our population at zero is 20. So we can conclude that 20, that's the P, is equal to D e to the zero power. Well, e to the zero is one. So that tells us that D has to be 20. So our final conclusion is that our population of rabbits is equal to 20 e to the 1 10th t. So that's how many rabbits there would be. Now, is that realistic? Probably not. Because if you know anything about the exponential function, it gets big. And it gets big pretty quick. If this were true, then what would it mean is that pretty soon we would have rabbits covering the earth in a layer kilometers deep. And not very long. Sometimes it feels like that during the summers here. But, um, but that's OK. That's OK. Even if it's not realistic, it's a stepping stone to things which are more realistic. And it's sometimes things are sort of better in the short term. Now, this phenomenon shows up a lot. So you're going to see this, particularly if you go to physics, you're going to see this all the time. Uh, and, uh, and also in chemistry. So there's something called exponential decay or exponential growth. And the idea is that what you're having changes, it's proportional to uh, how much is currently present. So in radioactive materials, you might have some radioactive substance. And what happens is that over time, it, it starts to change into some other material. And the rate at which it changes, it's proportional to how much there is there. So suppose you have that, you have something in the form, y prime is some multiple of y, and y of 0 equals y naught. So in fact, this is exactly what we had here. Here, the k was 1 tenth, and our initial value was 20. If you repeat the process that we just did, then what you'll have is, uh, oh, there's going to be a typo here. That's embarrassing. That's a t. I'll fix that later. All right. If you repeat the process that we just did, uh, you'll get the following. dy over y is k dt. You separate. You, you integrate both sides. You, you have your y equals some constant dE to the kt. And then you solve. And your initial condition says that your d is your y0. See, so you notice that the 20 matched with our initial value. So, all right, good. Applications. We like applications. So let's try some of this out. So this is radioactive decay. Now let's see how we can do. Quick problem. A new substance has been discovered called calculium. It exhibits a radioactive decay with a half-life of five years. So after five years, half of the material has changed into algebraum. Now, a deposit has recently been discovered in a museum piece that has 20 grams of the material and was donated to the museum 12 years ago. How much calculium was there at the time the piece was given to the museum? All right, so what do we have? Well, we have something which has radioactive decay. That's how it's behaving. See, it says it right here. Radioactive decay, which means, well, let's see. Um, I guess we can hmm, calculate Well, we'll use y. So that's that y of t equal amount of our calculium. Now, what we want to do is, is figure some stuff out. So we, because we know it, it satisfies some sort of notion of radioactive decay, we know that y prime is equal to ky for some value of k. Now the question is, do we have that value of k here? The answer is, not yet. But we can solve for it. So because we understand what happens with our, our half-life computations, we can say, all right, I really know that if I have y prime, I'll come up here, y prime equals ky, then I know that, that my solution has to look something like that, the following, some initial value e to the kt. So I can conclude, just from knowing that it has radioactive decay, 
that's equal to whatever amount there is at the beginning times e to the kt. Now, do we know how much time, how much there was at the beginning? Well, no, if we knew that, we would be done, right? Because that's the question, how much was there at the beginning? What do we know? Yeah, we know, what we know is that when we plug in 12, we get 20. Because there's 20 grams after 12 years. So that's one thing we know. But notice we have two things we, we don't yet know. Namely, what are y0, how much we have initially, and what is k? Well, is there any other piece of information that we haven't used yet? Yeah, the half-life of five years. So the way you use a half-life, it's actually really fun. You say, all right, how long does it take to get to, through a, a half-life? Well, if it's five years, OK, go five years. So if I've gone five years, how much do I have left? Half of the original. That's where the phrase half-life comes from. So it's half of the original. And now we're ready to go. Because look, I can plug 5 into here, the equation. y equals y naught e to the kt. I'll get y naught e to the k times 5. So from here, what can we do? Cancel the y naughts. And I get e to the 5k equals a half. So I want to get the k outside of the, the e, so we can take the natural log. 5k is equal to log of 1 half. Or, if you like, k is log of 1 half, and all of that is divided by 5. So the half-life gives you essentially what should k be. So k is log of a half divided by 5. How do we use that? Well, now we can update. So we have that, we have some initial value, and then we have e to the power log of 1 half times t over 5. All right? Well, now we use our other piece of information, which is after 20 years, uh, sorry, after 12 years, there's 20 grams. So 20 is equal to some value y naught e to the power log of 1 half times 12, which is t, divided by 5. Now, the good news is we just don't know why not. Everything else is a number. So we can conclude that why not, and this is not necessarily the most beautiful way to write it, but it's 20 divided by e to the log of a half times 12 over 5. And I don't know what that turns out to be. It's, it's some number. But that's the kind of computation you can do. Now, because of how common the model of exponential growth and decay is, uh, we will not do those examples. We'll do more interesting examples. So let's do some more interesting examples. Find y of x, given that y prime is equal to 3x squared e to the negative y, and y of 2 equals 0. So we start our process. Step one, separate. All right, I guess our first process is, what kind of problem is it? Well, what, what kind of problem is it? Yeah, it's a separable differential equation. How do we know that, you might say? Well, because we looked at it and we said, oh, look at this. There's a y prime, and there's a y. So I see both those pieces there, and when I see those two pieces together, that means there's an equation that involves both the derivative of the function and the function, which means that it's an equation of a derivative. All right. So I'm going to think of this as dy dx. And by the way, there's nothing special about y and x. We've used y and t. You can use any pair of symbols you like. 3x squared e to the minus y. So, step one. Do you remember what it was? Yeah, separate. Put everything on 
one side. So, well, let's multiply both sides by dx. So we'll get the 3x squared dx. And then, if I move the e to the negative y across, what will it come across as? Yeah, e to the positive y. Because really, e to the negative y is just another way of saying 1 over e to the y. So it's like 1 over e to the y, multiply by e to the y, and across you go. Now, notice, on one side, I only have the variable y. On the other side, only the variable x. That's the separation. That's what we like. Now we're ready for step two. We integrate. Integral of e to the y? e to the y. Integral of 3x squared? x cubed. And plus c. So this time I'm, I really will solve for my constant right away. Now we're into our third stage. So we've done the separate, we've done the integrate. Our last stage is uncomplicate. So, which involves solving for c and then finding y. So we take our initial conditions. So the way we read this is when I plug in x equals 2, I get out y equals 0. So I'm going to put in 0 for y and 2 for x. So I get e to the 0 is equal to 2 cubed plus c. E to the 0 is also known as 1. And 2 cubed is 8 plus c. So that tells us that c is 1 subtract 8, which is negative 7. So e to the y is equal to x cubed minus 7. Last thing is we need to solve for y, which means we need to get the y out of the exponent. All right, how do you get y out of an exponent? Natural log. So y, that's the natural log of e to the y, which is the natural log of x cubed minus 7. And therefore, our function that we were after was y equals the natural log of x cubed minus 7. So you can see, in some sense, it's a really easy flow. You separate it, you integrate it, and then you solve for c and rearrange. Well, that was not so bad. Let's keep it going then. So find y of x, given that y prime is equal to x over 2y plus 4, and that y of square root of 7 is equal to 0. Well, that's a, uh, hmm, huh, interesting choice, square root of 7. I wonder why they chose that. Well, we will find out in a few minutes. So let's begin our process. So y prime, we'll think of that as dy dx, is equal to x over 2y plus 4. I guess I skipped a step. I will say it's kind of spoilers. We're going to be doing separable differential equations all day today. And so normally, yes, you should make sure you know how do you recognize what type of problem. And in this case, you can see you have a, a derivative y prime and you have a y. And once you see those things mixing together, that's uh, separable differential equations. All right, so dy over dx equals x over 2y plus 4. We separate. On the x side, what will I have? x times dx. On the y side, what will I have? Yeah, 2y plus 4 dy. And I encourage you to get into the habit of putting the, the d thing on the end. So the dy goes on the end, the dx goes on the end. Because now what you want to do is you want to put this and just straight away into phase 2, which is integrate. And you want things that look like integrals. And in the integrals, you, you don't write an integral dx times x. Because that would just it would make your calculus teacher sad. You don't want to make your calculus teacher sad. You want to make your calculus teacher proud of you. That's our goal in life, to, to find uh, happiness in the, making our calculus teachers happy. No, that's probably not. But. All right. Integral of 2y plus 4. What would that be? Uh, y squared plus 4y. Yeah, y squared plus 4y. Equals? Yeah, x squared over 2 and plus c. 
Now we come to our next step, which is we need to plug in and solve for our initial condition. So we've separated and then we integrated. Now those are both straightforward. Now comes our solve for our initial condition. So we take our information. And what does this say? Well, it says when I plug in x equals square root of 7, I get y equals 0. So we're going to have 0 squared plus 4 times 0, because remember that's what 0 is, is equal to 1 half times square root of 7 squared plus c. All right. Well, what does that tell us about c? Well, the 0 goes away, 0 goes away. So square root of 7 squared means that c equals 7 halves. Negative 7 halves. Dramatic pause. Yes, you are correct. Thank you. Negative 7 halves. All right. Well, good. So y squared plus 4y is equal to 1 half x squared minus 7 halves. Okay. Are we done? Not yet. What do we need to do? Solve for y. Now, here we have the challenge. How many y's do we have? Two. That is too many. We want one y. One y to rule them all. One y to find them. One y to bring them all and in the light of calculus bind them. Okay, so how can we get down to one y? Well, we could factor. That would give us y times y plus 4. We still have two y's. Complete the square. That could help. So what would I need to add to complete the square? I need to add 4. And if I do it to one side, I should do it to the other side. So we get that y squared plus 4y plus 4 is equal to 1 half x squared plus a half. Now, when we complete the square, well, that gets us y plus 2 quantity squared, because that's how we chose the plus 4. Remember, how do you, do you complete the square? You, if you have a 1 in front of the, your, your square term, take the middle term, divide it by 2, and square it and add it in. So y plus 2 quantity squared is equal to, well, I'll just write it as a half times x squared plus 1. Now we're getting close. How do we get rid of the square? T take a square root. Yeah, so we get that y plus 2 is equal to square root of 1 half times x squared plus 1. Now, question. Have I missed anything? Plus or minus? Now, at this point, you're probably thinking, I'm not comfortable with what you're writing down, Steve. You should not be. So if I move the 2 across, so we get the two possibilities. y equals negative 2 plus 1 half times x squared plus 1. See, that's plus minus. So that means there's two chances, or two potential things. So negative 2 plus 1 half times x squared plus 1. Or it's negative 2 minus square root of 1 half times x squared plus 1. It can't be both. We have to pick a side. It's a little bit like the Twix nowadays. It used to be you could just have a Twix. Now you have to pick a left one or a right one. So which one do we have to pick? How do we know? Someone says we should pick the positive one. There's an optimist in the crowd. Why should we pick the positive one? Yeah, you always, if you have to go make a choice, you say, which choice is going to make my initial condition true? So let's plug in square root of 7 again. If I plug square root of 7 into, let's start with a negative 1. Square root of 7 squared would be 7, plus 1 would be 8. Divide that by 2 makes 4. Square root of 4 is 2. If I take negative 2 minus 2, I don't get 0. But if I do it here, 
again, the same process, I'd get uh, 1 half times square root of 7 squared plus 1 would be 4, and the square root of 4 is 2, and negative 2 plus 2 is 0. So the initial condition, if you ever have to make a decision, you're given a, a choice, use the initial condition. The initial condition will guide you as to which choice to make. So there's the answer, negative 2 plus the square root of a half times x squared plus 1. All right, I think we have at least time for one more like this. Given that p prime equals t squared plus t squared over p squared, and p times the cubed root of log of 2 equals 1, well, of course, because that's where we naturally want to have initial conditions, find a general expression for p of t. Now, we look at this and say, okay, this looks like differential equation because we see our p prime and we see a p, but it's a little bit different. You see, last time when we've been doing differential equation, there's always like, oh, things are multiplying. Here we have things adding. So you should be like, uh, a little bit nervous, but just a little bit, because you should have faith that we're going to ask you things that you can do. So in particular, what we want to do is we really want to find a way to rewrite this right-hand side so it's something involving t times something involving this other variable p. So in this case, it's not so bad. What we can do is say, oh, I can pull out the t squared. Then we're left with p plus 1 over p squared. Well, from here, we're, we're pretty good to go, but let's go a little bit further. Let's combine these together into a single fraction. If we wanted to get a, a single fraction, the, the second term, what would be the common denominator? P squared. What would be the numerator? P cubed plus 1. All right, so perhaps we need to do a little bit of work to rearrange. So we haven't done our separation yet, but we're getting close. We recall that P prime is DP divided by DT. Now we do our true separation. If we do that, we'll get moving, bringing this across, and when we bring it across, we flip it. So P squared over P cubed plus 1 DP is equal to T squared dt. So I've separated the p's from the t's. Now what's the next step? We integrate. Now notice t squared, what would make this easier to integrate? If we had a 3 in front, because 3t squared is really easy to integrate. Can we just go ahead and put a 3t squared like that? Well, we can if we do it over there. That's perfectly allowed. You can throw constants in. Just make sure if you throw constants in, you balance it out. Whatever you do to one side, you do it to the other. All right, let's do the integral of the, the right-hand side. That seems easier. Integral of t cubed. Oh, sorry, 3t squared. Oh, I wonder what it is. <laughs> it's t cubed. All right, Freudian slip. All right. So t cubed plus c. Now, the integral of 3p squared over p cubed plus 1, is that on our list of basically our, our basic 8? No. Very few things are on that list. In fact, there's only 8 of them. How can we integrate this? If you do u substitution, and I'm going to skip the u substitution, but the u substitution is u equals p cubed plus 1, du equals 3p squared. So this will become natural log of u or natural log of p cubed plus 1. All right, that's the, what you would end up with. Now, that's the integrate. You should do the u substitution. You should check it on, on your own time. Are we done? Nope. Well, not yet, because we've got to put in initial conditions. So we put in the, that when p equals 1, you get that the natural log of 2, because I get 1 cubed plus 1, is equal to the cubed root of the natural log of 2 cubed plus c. What does that tell us about c? It tells us c is 0, because these are both log 2. So from here, we're just a hop, skip, and a jump away. We just need to get p. So we have to start freeing it from its various bounds. How do we get rid of the log? E. e. So p cubed plus 1, 
is e to the t cubed. How do we get rid of the plus 1? We subtract 1. How do we get rid of the cubed? We take the cubed root. So p is equal to e, sorry, the cubed root of e to the t cubed minus 1. And that's our answer. That's not so bad. We can do that. Let's do another problem. Another word problem. So this is good. See, word problems are helpful because it makes us feel like we're doing stuff that you might see out in the world. On their 30th birthday, an art history major opened an IRA account which has a return of 5% and started depositing $500 each year. So if M is the number of dollars in the account at time T in years, since we're turning 30, then we have that the rate at which the amount in the account is changing is 500 plus 120th M. Okay, so where are the pieces coming from? See, the 500 is every year you get $500. The 120th M is that 5%. And so there's two things going on. There's the two actions. There's the money going in, there's the percentage return. And so the total change is the combination of these two. So the question, if the art history major retires at age 70, how much money will be in the account? Now notice this is not just that radioactive decay or, or growth, because that would just be if there's the 120th M. Now there's sort of this extra bumping every, every well, year, although what we do is we pretend like things are moving in a continuous fact, fashion. All right, so to help simplify things, let's just say when they open the account, which is zero, there is zero dollars. So that'll be our initial conditions, because they just opened it. So let's work through here. Well, what do we have? So we have 500 plus 120th M. That's going to be equal to dm dt. Now, we're going to move the M across. Now, we could just move everything across. But maybe, since we have a fraction, let's not move the whole thing. Suppose we pull out a 120th. And if we did that, well, 20 times 5,000 is a, it's a big number. Uh, well, what, what number is it? Well, if we times that, uh, without an extra zero, and then five times two is 10, so it would be 10,000. All right, so 10,000 plus M is what we have, 120 times 10,000 plus M. We now rearrange the rate of change in m, dm, over 10,000 plus m is 1 20th. How is things changing with time? So that's our separate. So now we've separated. Now we integrate. So integrate, integrate. So here, what do we do? Well, substitution. We have a little bit of time on this one. So u equals 10,000 plus n, du equals dm. So this would become the integral of du over u, which is log of u plus c, if they were just doing this in isolation. We put back what u is, so we have that the left-hand side is log of 10,000. Oh, how many zeros to be out here? Do, 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 do. No, that, we should have, okay, 10,000. We'll make that part of our plus m. And that's going to be equal to 1 20th t plus c, because this is a straightforward integral on the right-hand side. Now, we do have some information, um, namely how much there is initially. And so what do we know? We know at time zero, there's zero dollars. So we get that log of 10,000 is equal to c, because I plug in m equals zero, plug in t equals zero. All right, so putting that back in, log of 10,000 plus m is equal to 1 20th plus log of 10,000. Now, we can do a couple of things. First thing is, uh, whoop, the 1 20th t. <laughs> 1 20th t plus log of 10,000. Now, one thing we could do is we can take both sides to the power. Let me just point out another thing you can do is if you're not comfortable, if you subtract over, then you can say that, oh, this is log of 10,000 plus m, 
minus log of 10,000, which is equal to 1 20th times t. And then subtraction in logs becomes division. And so if you divide 10,000 plus m divided by 10,000, you get 1 plus m over 10,000. So I just divide both terms by 10,000. Now, well, we do what we normally do. Raise both sides to the power e. So we have 1 plus m divided by 10,000 is equal to e to the power 1 20th times t. From here, this 1, move it over by subtracting. So then we get m over 10,000 is equal to e to the 1 20th t minus 1. And then finally, we get that m is equal to 10,000 times e to the 1 20th t minus 1. All right. So now that is how much money there is at any given time. But that, what's the question? Our question isn't to find M. Our question is, suppose they retire at age 70. How much money will be in the account? Well, all right. If we think about it, if they're age 70, we start at age 30. So 70 means that we want to figure out what happens at time T equals 40. Okay, so we plug in t equals 40 into here, and then we get the following. The amount of money in the account is 10,000 times 1 20th times 40. Well, that would be 2. Subtract 1. Now, you might say, is that enough to retire? Well, e squared is not that big. See, e is less than 3, so e squared definitely is less than 9. Subtract 1. So that says that there is less than 80k in the retirement account. All right, not great. But remember, it's an art history major. They're used to living on very little money. So maybe it's okay for them. They'll survive. They'll survive. Okay. One more. So a, a tank of water has a capacity of 500 gallons, has water flowing into it at the rate of 50 gallons per minute, and at the same time there's a hole in the bottom where one-fifth of the water which is present in the tank flows out every minute. So we have this tank. What's happening? Well, let's just draw ourselves a tank. So there's water coming in, and this is coming in at 50 gallons per minute. And then, there's a hole, let's just draw as a spigot, and then water's coming out. Now, the inflow is constant. See, it's always 50 gallons per minute. In the hole, it depends. See, if my tank was empty, nothing would come out. So it's not always going to be 50 gallons. If the tank is full, well, it'd be one-fifth, so it could be 100 gallons. So it's anywhere between zero and 100. Well, it's not anywhere. It's one-fifth of how much there is at a given time. So we should label that. So let's have uh, the amount of water. Well, let's call it W. So W of T equals amount of water in the tank. All right. Well, what do we have? Then the outflow, that's one-fifth of W. Okay. So the inflow is a constant 50. But the outflow varies, one-fifth of W. Now, what do we have? Now, it says if the tank initially started with 400 gallons of water, give an equation that determines the amount of water in the tank at any given time. Okay, well, we should be able to do that. So, what do we have? Well, we want to say what's happening to the water. So one thing we can do is we can talk about how the amount of water is changing. So that's W prime. So a derivative talks about change. So how is the amount of water in the tank changing? Well, it's changing in two ways. Namely, there's water being added. And so the addition is a constant 50. And there's water being removed. And so that's a minus 1 5th 
times w. So it's very similar to the last problem, but here we now have sort of, uh, instead of having a, a positive positive, now we have sort of a positive and a negative. So let's think about what's true. Um, well, we just repeat the same process, right? So this is equal to 250 minus w over 5. And the other side, dw dt. Clear your denominators, or rather I should say, move stuff around. And we get that dw over 250 minus w is equal to 1 -fifth dt. Now we would integrate both sides. Well, the right-hand side, that's fairly straightforward. That's 1 -fifth t plus c. All right. How about the left-hand side? Well, this is not so bad. And sort of just make a little notes on the side here. If you were to set u equal 250 minus w, then du would be minus dw, which means that we're going to introduce a minus sign. And so what you'd end up with is you'd end up with a minus du over u. So we end up with minus log u, and then we say, ah, put it back what we have. So this left-hand side becomes minus log 250 minus w. Well, let's uh, move the minus across. So log of 250 minus w, that's minus 150t plus c. Now I could solve for my initial condition here, because actually, what is our initial condition? Let's see that. See, this says the tank initially started out with 400 gallons. So this part, initially 400, means that w at 0 equals 400. So I could use that to plug it in. Now, you might notice if we plugged in 400 here, we'd run into trouble if we didn't have the absolute value. So you should be careful. Technically, it's always absolute value. Or we can hold off and just take care of that in a few moments. Now, let's uh, do e to the, both sides, clear out, and we get 250 minus w is equal e to the minus 150 t plus c. But remember, we can do that same thing we did before. That's really e to the minus 150 t times e to the c. And this e to the c I can treat as just a number. So the number I'll treat it as, I'll treat it as just some constant t, e to the minus 150 times t. All right, so we're almost there. We just need to rearrange. And so we get, coming over here, that w, so I'm going to move this w across, move that term across, is equal to 250 minus some d, e to the minus 1 -fifth times t. Now, what do we have? Well, plug in our initial conditions. 400 is equal to 250 minus d, e to the 0, which means, if we look at this, well, d has to equal negative 150. So plug it back in. And what do we end up with? We end up with w equals 250. So minus d is plus 150 e to the minus 1 -fifth times t. Now, what does this look like? Well, what it looks like is if you were to sketch your, your function here, so here's time, and here's w, and here's w equals 250. What's going to happen is in the long run, you'll get that this, this part here goes to zero. And if this part goes to zero, it's approaching 250. So in fact, what ends up happening is we start here, and then the tank slowly sort of levels off. On a side note, it, you could have changed the initial amount in the tank. If you had started down below here, it actually would have gone up and then sort of leveled off. Indeed, no matter how much you have at any given time in the tank, it's always going to want to drift towards 250. And somehow, 250 is, is that sweet, sweet balance point. Now, we could have gotten the answer of 250 without doing any work at all. And by the way, this is the answer we wanted. We wanted the function. How did we know that 250 was that nice balancing point where things would sort of level off without doing any work? Well, what I'm after when I'm at a, a point like this is this is where the inflow and the outflow match. Or really, you can think of this 
as this is where we would want w prime equals zero. That's where things balance out just the right amount. So if you go back to your original equation for the differential equation, say, well, when do I get w prime equals zero? Well, it's not too hard to see that you'll get it at w equals 250. So it's not surprising that we see 250 being that, that nice balancing point. And that is uh, how you fill up a tank with water. Now, if you like this type of problem, I've got great news for you. You're going to get to do these problems over and over again in differential equations. And you'll start to see, it's like, okay, if I understand what processes are causing things to change, then I can get a handle on how fast things are moving and what the actual value is at any given time. And that's it for now. All right, see you next time. Bye.